This case takes place in Sunnyvale, California. A young woman named Laura Black arrived home to find a small note jammed in her door. Sprawled across the note was a warning, which read, You better read this. Before even opening the note, she already knew who it was from. It was from a man who had been stalking her for the last four years. A man who had gone to great lengths to make her life a living hell. His name was Richard Farley. There seemed to be nothing Laura could do to lose the attention of Richard. She had told him politely that she didn't want to have any relationship with him. But despite this, he still pursued her, confronted her, and harassed her both at work and at home. After being harassed over the phone, she decided to get an unlisted phone number. But this only resulted in him calling her at work instead. Laura moved house, but he would always find her new address and would watch her at night. Richard would wait next to her car after she finished work, and when security told him that he could no longer be on the premises, he would just simply wait to cross the street. He fantasized about them being a couple. Richard was later told by one of Laura's male friends that he would go to jail if he did not stop harassing her. But all this did was anger Richard. Once open, the note in Laura's door read, It's not in your best interest for him to interfere. He doesn't have any idea what he is getting into. You better tell him, I better never see the police around me. The case of Richard Farley is one of an obsessive, vindictive, and very dangerous man who had an extremely unhealthy fixation on a promising young electrical engineer, Laura Black. A cashier who worked at a 7-Eleven store across the road from where Laura lived said that Richard was in the area all the time and maybe took one day off a week. Laura and Richard originally met when they both worked for the Electromagnetic Systems Labs Inc., also known as ESL a tech company in Silicon Valley in 1984. Richard was a computer technician and Laura was an engineer. Within just one month of meeting, Richard began his strange obsession. In the fall of 1985, Laura asked the Human Resources Department at ESL Inc. for assistance on the escalating situation, and the company instructed Richard to attend psychological counseling sessions. However, the stalking continued, and when he began threatening other co-workers in 1986, the company was forced to fire him. After being fired, Richard told Laura, Once I am fired, you won't be able to control me ever again. Pretty soon, I'll crack under the pressure and run amok and destroy everything in my path. Richard later got two jobs at neighboring rival companies. This was so he could remain within reach of Laura. During this time, Richard was in severe financial trouble. He lost his house, car, and computer, and amassed $40,000 worth of debt. Richard was forced to move from an affluent area into a dilapidated single-story house near San Jose. He paid low rent for his accommodation in return for fixing up the many issues with the property. Richard grew up in a family of six children. As a boy, he was self-centered, which is a trait common in stalkers. He dominated his younger brothers, mimicking his abusive father. Later in life, he filled his need to dominate by spying on people. He gathered intelligence for the Navy, where spying was part of the job, and learned many tactics that he would later use on Laura. The more she turned him away, the more invasive Richard became. He snuck into her office, made copies of her house keys, and left a spare set on her desk. Richard did this so she would no longer feel safe anywhere, and his aggression would soon escalate violently. Feeling isolated, scared, and not knowing who to turn to, Laura eventually filed a lawsuit against Richard, and a judge granted a restraining order until a further hearing happened. However, this would prove to be a fatal error in judgment. When filing the lawsuit, Laura said, I have been afraid of what this man might do to me if I file this action. However, I'm at the end of my rope. I need the court's assistance and the assistance of the appropriate police agencies to keep this man out of my life. 
I have never had a personal relationship with Mr. Richard, and there is no rational reason as to why Mr. Richard acts the way he does. Richard stated, You cost me my job, $40,000 in equity taxes I can't pay, and a foreclosure. Yet, I still like you. Why do you want to find out how far I'll go? Enraged by the fact that he could no longer see Laura and with the financial hardships he was experiencing, Richard fully lost control. He sent falsified evidence to Laura's attorney showing that they had in fact been in a relationship this whole time. But this evidence was deemed to be an utter fabrication and was dismissed. Going against his restraining order, Richard spent $2,000 on purchasing a 12-gauge shotgun and over 3,000 rounds of ammunition. On the 16th of February 1988, the day before he was due in court for the hearing that Laura had brought against him, he loaded seven guns and a rifle, made his way to his former employers whilst Laura was working there to make her regret what she had done. Richard's original plan was to go to Laura's workplace, and force her to rescind the restraining order, or he would end his life there and then. But when he arrived, things panned out very differently. Richard was armed with a semi-automatic shotgun, other guns he owned, over 1,000 rounds of ammunition, a foot-long book knife, smoke bombs, a gasoline container, and leather gloves. As he approached the building, Richard looked like he was ready to go to war. At roughly 3 p.m., Richard claimed his first victim. In the car park outside the ESL building, he shot and killed a former colleague that he knew personally. Richard then entered the locked headquarters of the ESL building by firing his way through the glass side door. Whilst entering, he shot a man dead who was sitting behind his desk in reception. He continued to take aim at employees whilst he moved through the building to Laura's second floor office. On the stairway, he shot and killed another man, and seriously wounded another two people. Laura had seen that Richard was coming directly to her office, so she locked her door and hid under the desk. Richard had seen her lock the door. And as he walked over, he pulled out his semi-automatic shotgun and shut out the door's locks, blowing the door off its hinges. He walked straight over to Laura, took aim, and fired. But fortunately, the bullet missed. He shot a second time and hit Laura in the shoulder. The bullet shattered her shoulder and collapsed her lung. Laura stated that she could feel her lungs start to fill with blood. With that, Richard thought that he had finally got his revenge on Laura, and he left the office, continuing to take aim at other employees in the building, killing a further two men and two women. Laura knew that if she did not escape, she would bleed to death. Then, when the gunfire stopped, she could hear Richard on the phone in the office space next to her, talking to the police. She said, I knew the office I was in had two exits, and his only had one, because I knew the building well enough, and so I figured this was my chance to escape. Laura got up and was able to get out of the building to safety. Whilst Richard was on the phone to the police, he said, I just wanted her to stop hanging up on me, and to stop treating me like shit. She wasn't going to get away with it. The SWAT team swiftly arrived and their standoff began. Richard avoided being taken out by snipers because he was moving from one office space to another during the standoff. He told the hostage negotiator that he just wanted to shoot up the office equipment. After a six hour standoff, Richard began to cry and considered ending his life there and then. In exchange for a turkey sandwich and a diet soda, Richard agreed to surrender. In total, seven people had been killed and four were wounded, including a woman who broke her arm as she fell down a flight of stairs attempting to escape. The police identified the fatally wounded as Joe Silver, 43, Wayne Williams, 23, Glenda Moritz, 27, Ron Reed, 26, Helen Lamparta, 49, 
Lawrence J. Kane, 46, and Ron Downey, 36. The wounded were Richard Townsley, who was shot in the chest, Greg Scott, who was shot in the forehead, Patty Marcourt, who broke her arm, and of course, Laura Black. Only 12 hours after the massacre took place, a Terry Ad judge made the restraining order permanent, but also stated, This was a conscious racing incident. It shows pieces of paper do not stop bullets. Richard Filey, who previously had no criminal record, was tried for first-degree murder on seven counts. Although Richard admitted to the murders, he pleaded not guilty to the charges, stating that he had not planned to kill anyone and only planned to end his own life if he could not win the affection of Laura. His attorney argued that Richard was not a violent man and that he was merely blinded by his obsession for Laura. The attorney actually argued that he would never kill again if found not guilty. The prosecution documented every step of his stalking, using all of the letters that he had sent to Laura. Also, the purchases of the weapons, citing that this proved that Richard did not just snap, rather, it was extensively planned. On the 2nd of October, 1991, a jury found Richard guilty of all seven counts of first-degree murder. And on the 17th of January, 1992, he was sentenced to death. To this day, Richard remains on death row in San Quentin Prison. In the wake of the actions of Richard, California passed the country's first anti-stalking laws. And the other states followed suit. I shall now pass you over to Mike from Bizarre Bazaar. Hello everyone, and thanks for having me back, D. I want to show you some correspondence that I had with Farley. It was very unusual to say the least. I first sent him a generic Christmas card. I do this with a number of inmates that I want to start writing to, as it's a good way of opening conversation. Thank you for your Christmas card. I got it earlier. Since you wrote you'd send a follow-on letter, I waited before replying. I've waited enough, I think, so I thought I'd write thanking you. I admit, I totally forgot to send the follow-up letter. But to be fair, this letter was written on the 23rd of January, so it's not like he was waiting dead long. But this is Richard Farley we're talking about. I'm doing okay, all things considered. How are things with you? As to what I'm doing, I went, I'm still OCD. I like to solve the code word puzzle in the Human Rights Magazine. As a result, over the years, I've compiled a box of words to assist me. For the last month, I've been adding a bunch more words. This endeavour takes me hours each day, so I don't do much else. This to me sounds absolutely nuts. So this mass murderer is now spending his days finding words and adding them to a box? Is he trying to convince me that he's no longer a danger? Or is he actually telling the truth? Was my name given to you by Sonia at Human Rights? Nope, I've never heard of Sonia or the magazine. You're an infamous criminal who committed a heinous act, and that's how I've heard of you. My previous pen pal died from pancreatic cancer not too long ago. Now, I've not had a chance to explain to him who I am and what I do, and this is normally something I do in the first letter. So he has no idea who I am, and he doesn't know that I know various people who already write to him. So this here is a form of guilt tripping. He's basically saying he's got no friends, and making it out like he only had one pen pal. Anyway, thanks for the card. Sincerely, Richard Farley. I seriously doubt any of his pen pals recently died, and I also doubt that he just spends his days putting words into a box. I feel like this whole letter is just a big sympathy pitch, in order to eventually get some money out of me, something obviously I don't do. So anyway, I wrote Richard back, explaining who I was and what I do with my YouTube channel. And knowing that he's an obsessive stalker, I wanted to try and get some kind of reaction out of him, as I was pretty sure the first letter was all a big lie. So I sent him a questionnaire, asking him a range of questions, from his likes to his dislikes, and events that happened in his life. Seeking information is something he's driven by, so I wanted to see how he would react when someone was trying to get information about him. This is what he sent back. 
out of a sense of politeness. I'll answer your last letter, then I won't write any more. Having your YouTube channel and talking about prisoners, for me, is a deal breaker. For better or worse, depending on one's point of view, while I'm still in court, I don't need creative or misinterpretations of things I've said or written attributed to me posted on any website. This is a fair enough response, and this is why I'm always upfront about what I do. Being transparent is the only way it works. He continued, I was kidding about really being OCD, about my box of words. I've been warned never to joke around with people one has just met. They're quite likely to take everything said or written literally. It's my hobby. You can tell he feels exposed here. I mean, if it was a joke, it wasn't very funny, was it? Just plain weird. He said it for sympathy, and now he knows a little bit about me. He knows I'm aware of what he's trying to do. So now he just tries to pass it off as a joke. <laughs> the second deal breaker is the list of things requested about me. I'm surprised you didn't ask for my social security number, my mother's maiden name, the names of my pets, if I had any, or any medical history, and other personal information that can be used to steal my identity. You can really feel the venom here, can't you? I'm going to be polite and hope your intentions were not evil, and you aren't some kind of nut or autograph seeker. Your request reminded me of a guy who wanted a signed toe tag. I guess there are way too many nutcases out there or people who interact with their cell phones so much they no longer have any social skills. Whoa, being called a nutcase by Richard Farley is pretty rich. You can tell he is furious in this letter. It's interesting how someone who has gathered so much information on other people becomes so angry when his privacy is breached slightly. It really gets under his skin. We were never going to continue our correspondence anyway, so I'm glad I got such a revealing response in such a short time. He actually mentioned me to another one of his pen pals. He said there was some crazy guy in England who was asking all these questions about him. I was almost honoured that I wound him up so much. He ended the letter with this. Good luck in life. Take care. Interesting how he has not signed it this time. He may as well have stuck the V's on there instead. And that concludes my short correspondence with Richard Farley. I hope it gives you a little more insight into the man. He's clearly still quite an unstable person and I doubt he will ever change. <laughs>